Let's turn the Bible to the book of Joshua tonight. Chapter number 5 and verse 13. Joshua 5, 13. It came to pass when Joshua was at was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he, the man with the sword drawn, said, Nay. But as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Father, I pray that you'd anoint your word now tonight as it goes forth. Glorify thyself, our Father, through this messenger, Lord, to the people here. May we give glory to thy blessed, righteous, holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, it'd be kind of hard with words to describe what you just read. But here is the military leader of, a, uh, of an army that's about to go to battle. And this is right before the battle. This is the eve of the battle when they go and take Jericho. And, of course, he goes out, and I'm sure he's probably looking around and checking out the area and seeing where his troops might be placed and how, that, uh, how, the, battle might, uh, how the battle might go. And he comes to face to face with the angel of the Lord. Now, the reason I know it's the angel of the Lord is because he worshipped him and the angel didn't stop him. It didn't stop him. Now, it's not, you don't worship angels, but the angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate manifestation of Christ. We call it uh, Christophany, to be more, more exact. It's the Lord Jesus Christ showing up here as the captain of the host of the Lord. That's who he is, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. And here we have a situation where we're about to go to battle. I don't call your attention to something that's important here. He said, take your shoes off. You're standing on holy ground. Now, most of the commentators will say that the ground is holy because the Lord's there. But only one other place in the Old Testament does it say to take off your shoe like this, that it's a ground. He didn't call it holy ground, but he said it's holy. And that is in the book of uh, Exodus when Moses is standing at the burning bush. And in Exodus chapter number 3 and verse 5, the Lord said, Take your shoes off, Moses. You're standing on holy ground. This holy ground means this is ground dedicated to God. Dedicated to God. The Hebrew word is kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Kadosh barnea was holy barnea, dedicated to God. It was there that the spies were sent out. They could have taken the land. They could have gone into Hebron. And they could have taken it, saved them 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, but they didn't do it. If they had only believed God, they would have sanctified him in the eyes of the people. If you remember when Moses uh, told the Lord, our people are thirsty, they want water. And so what did the Lord say to do to the rock? He said, smite it. But then he went back the second time, so what did he say to do to the rock? Speak to it. Now, here's what God said to Moses when Moses failed to do what he should have done the second time. Here's what the Lord said. This is very revealing. God said, you failed to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. I want you to, I want you to kind of digest that tonight and think on what I'm talking about here. In other words, you, you, you failed to set me apart in their eyes as the one, not you, Moses, but I am the one providing the water for them. You're just the instrument in my hands. But Moses took it upon himself to smite that rock the second time. And out of grace, God gave them water. But it cost Moses dearly. It cost him dearly. Because this was a holy place. Holy in what sense? It is set apart to give glory to God. 
It is set apart where God would be sanctified in the eyes of the people. Now, this is a principle tonight that I want to try to get across to you because it's very important. To set aside Jericho, to take this whole Canaanite town and the area around it and set it apart unto God is to make it holy. Not holy in the sense that it's pure or good or anything of that nature, but holy in the sense that God is going to be sanctified in the eyes of the people, and not only the people here, but the word of it is going to travel inland. And it did travel inland. The reputation of the battles that Israel had won went before them and into the land they went. When Israel came out of Egypt, they had, they had a battle. They, had to, they left out on the Passover night. Uh, Pharaoh chased them, and he came upon them. But the Bible tells us that God put a, a wall of fire between, between Pharaoh and his chariots and Israel. And then the Lord opened up the Red Sea and allowed them to pass over. And then when Pharaoh went into the Red Sea to get them, the waters came down on top of Pharaoh and they all died. They came out of there and they went into the Sinai Peninsula. I've been to the Sinai Peninsula. It's one of the most desolate places on earth. You talk about a desert. But I went into the, they went into the Sinai Peninsula and uh, they traveled up through there and they came to Og, king of Bashan, and Sihon. And these two kings fell before them. God gave them victory after victory. And so the word went before them. And, of course, I preached to you last Sunday about Rahab. She heard about how that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had delivered Israel. All right. So these, these kings of these cities, these towns, the kings are falling at the hands of Israel. But you see, friend, when they got to cross the Jordan River and got into Jericho, this is no longer Moab. This is no longer Egypt. This is no longer Sinai. This is Israel. And they were coming into the land of promise that God gave to Abraham. Long time before, God told Abraham, this is your land and your descendants, Genesis 15, and laid the borders out. And so now it is no longer them defeating their enemies out here in a foreign land. Now they are coming into the land of Israel, and this is the first battle they're going to fight in Israel. Proper. This is important. The first battle means that this is the first fruits unto the Lord God. And in Scripture, the first fruits always belong to the Lord. Just like we are the church of the firstborn, firstborn and first fruits are kin to each other. And so when they crossed the Jordan River, you know the story how they did that, and they set up camp at Gilgal. And at Gilgal, they were circumcised because they rolled the reproach of Egypt away. And in order for them to come back under a covenant relationship with God so that their God could go out and fight for them, they had, to, they had to observe what God gave Moses. In other words, they had to go through the valley and the channel of death, come out on the other side, and separate themselves from the flesh. And now they are ready with the Ark of the Covenant that goes before them, and it goes around and around what God claims his own. This was his. All of the spoils of Jericho were the Lord's because it's the firstborn. What that means is that what happens at Jericho establishes a precedent that will be continued over and over and over again throughout all the land. The Lord will go before them and fight their battles. Let that settle in. The Lord will go before them and fight their battles. The battle is the Lord's. It still is. It still is, and he will go before them and fight their battles. And so, to sanctify the Lord in the sight of the children of Israel, Joshua took his shoes off and acknowledged at that point right there, this is yours holy unto the Lord. That's what that means. And so, when Achan took that wedge of gold and silver and Babylonian garment, and hid it in his tent and dug a hole and put it in his tent. What he did was to take what was holy unto God 
and try to use it for his own purposes. And that which was holy to God became a curse to him. Now there's a great lesson to learn in that. Because that which is holy unto God is holy unto God. And if you do not make a difference between that which is profane and that which is holy, you get in trouble. Amen. You get in trouble real fast. And Joshua understood the principle. He took his shoes off because this was holy unto God. But Achan, Achan, seeing all of the wealth, you see Jericho was at a crossroads. And if you read some history about Jericho, you'll find that they profited in trade. And caravans would come up through there and they would trade with them. This is why they had a Babylonish garment. And so when the children of Israel got in there, they saw all of this wealth and they saw all of this stuff. And Achan saw all of that and he said, surely, good night. This is the spoils of war. Well, later on when they went into Ai, Ai, how many of you read about Ai now? How many of you read, read, read the book of Joshua? If you haven't, you need to read it. Joshua is the book of conquest, and it's the book where God gives them the land. And all these kings uh, came against them, the Gibeonites. How many know who the Gibeonites are? Gibeonites who came with moldy bread and old clothes and so forth. We'll get into all that later. But what happened is that when they came into the land, they came into the land, a reputation went before them, and only a certain few would believe. Only a few. The few is very few. A prostitute on top of the wall believed. According to the book of Hebrews chapter number 11, they were given the opportunity to believe or reject what they had heard about the Lord God Almighty. God is a gracious, gracious, merciful God. I know a lot of people come along and say, well, don't you think that this is a vile, petty, tribal God in the Old Testament that has them go in and kill women and children? along with what happens, you know, when the, men take, when the men take the place? Well, how many of you have any idea how many men, women and children were killed at Nagasaki and Hiroshima? How many of you have any idea of how many women and children were killed in Dresden, Dresden, Germany, when they firebombed it and burned people alive? Or women and children were killed in London, England, when Hitler sent his V-1 and V-2 rockets down on that city? Don't, you know, don't get sanctimonious and high and mighty about what happened back thousands of years ago when these people, they're killing women and children right now. They sure are. It doesn't make it right, but it's a fact of life. It's just the way that it is. That if it, if it, if it, when it comes down to an all-out war, usually there are the, no holes are barred. And so they go at each other. But this is, this is taking the promised land but the promised land can only be taken by the promise. And the promised land can only be enjoyed by the covenant. And the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob must go before them or they'll never, ever, ever win the battles. And so he went before them in the Ark of the Covenant. And that Ark was precious to them. And that Ark went around Jericho and God laid his claim to it. And the children of Israel understood, the Lord is going to be sanctified in your sight today. And on the seventh day, on the seventh time around, the walls came tumbling down when they shouted. They blew the ram's horns, and then they shouted with a great shout. And that shout brought those walls down. Well, the word traveled about as fast as the walls came down to the rest of the land. It traveled that fast because these kings were waiting for them as they moved on into the land. Israel stayed at Gilgal. That was their headquarters for a long time. They stayed at Gilgal. They didn't stay in Jericho. They didn't stay in any of the cities that they conquered. They would always come back to Gilgal where the 12 stones had been taken out of the middle of the Jordan River and piled up as a witness and testimony of those that had been dead that were raised up and there was a witness of the life that he was giving to them. These 12 stones in Gilgal became a place throughout Israel's history. They would bring kings there to be anointed over their, over their people. Gilgal became a very famous place, a very a very, a, a very uh, sacred place to the children of Israel. And the Ark of the Covenant stayed at Gilgal until they finally moved it. And when they moved it, they took it to Shiloh. They took the Ark from Gilgal to Shiloh. There in Shiloh, they kept it in a tent, a tabernacle. There at Shiloh. Until the Ark was eventually moved out of there 
and it was taken to the house of Abinadab. Stayed there for 20 years. Then the ark was carried from there to the house of Obed-Edom. Stayed there till David took the ark into Jerusalem and put it in a tent that he had made himself in the city of David until the ark was eventually carried from the tent in the city of David into the temple that Solomon built for it. And then the ark was placed in the Holy of Holies between the cherubim, but the house that, that Solomon built for it. David could not build a house. So the ark was important. Everywhere the ark went, the children of Israel knew God was there. One time the ark was stolen or taken in battle. The Philistines carried it off. And you know the story, what happened. It was carried off into the five Philistine cities. And, and, and the day came when they couldn't get rid of it too soon. <laughs> it didn't belong there. It belonged back at Shiloh. It belonged in the tent. But it came out of there. It came out of the five cities of the Philistines on a cart and uh, pulled by, by an oxen. And it went to the house. It went to, the, it went to Beth Shemesh, which is the house of the sun. And, and, and the Israelites looked into the ark. They raised the mercy seat. They raised that, that seat of gold. You remember I told you about this the other day. They raised it. They raised the mercy, looked past mercy, and looked down into the righteous, holy judgment of God. And he smote them dead by the tens of thousands. By the tens of thousands they died. And so having dead people all over the place, they carried that ark to kirjath Jerem to the house of Abinadab. Now, I don't know if I'd wanted it brought to my house or not, but they brought it into his house. And he had two sons that watched over that ark for 20 years. And when they moved it out of the house of Abinadab, they put it on a cart, and David led the way, and he was dancing before it. And it was on a cart. It was supposed to be carried, not on a cart. But it went to the house and put it on a cart, and they carried it away on that cart, and it, and it got on a rocky place, and the ark began to slip. It began to move, and, and it would have fallen, apparently, off of the cart. And Uzzah, who had no doubt grown up with this ark, he put forth his hand to stop it, to keep it from falling. And God smote him dead in his tracks. Right there he died. And David didn't know how to handle it. Who is this holy Lord God that we serve? So they took it into the house of Obed-Edom, a Gentile. His name means servant of Edom. Obed in Hebrew is servant. Obed-Edom, servant of Edom. Yet he was like he was like Uriah the Hittite. He was like Ruth the Moabitess. He was one of these Gentiles that had come into Israel under the wings of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when they carried that ark into the house of Obed-Edom, here's what the Bible says. It says that God blessed him. God blessed the house of Obed-Edom. He had killed tens of thousands for looking into the ark. But when the ark was brought and kept in its rightful place, Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. And Obed-Edom acknowledged that. He never dared put his hand and raise the lid of that ark and look inside. He left it where it should be. He left that which is holy where that which is holy should be. And God blessed him. And for three months, God had blessed him. And David heard about that. David heard about God blessing Obed-Edom. So he went back, got the ark, and this time they carried it into Jerusalem. And that's where it belonged to begin with. And he put it in a tent in the city of David. And the city of David is right below Jerusalem on the mountain going down to the, uh, to the, to the valley of uh, Gehenna. The city of David, they've excavated it quite a bit. There's quite a bit over there, uh, as a matter of fact. And they took it to the city of David, and it stayed in the city of David until they took it and put it in the into the temple that Solomon had built. And, and, and never again, never again did Israel ever dare raise that lid and look inside. Now when God saved your soul, he put something holy in you. He put the Holy Ghost in you. The Holy Ghost is not of man. The Holy Ghost is holy, holy, holy unto the Lord God Almighty. It's a very precious thing indeed. Now, if a man doesn't have the Holy Spirit, it doesn't belong to the Lord. But if you're born again tonight, you have the Holy Ghost. 
Don't ever, don't ever let anybody mess your mind up and try to tell you that after you get saved, you need to get the Holy Ghost. Amen. They're all messed up in the book of Acts and don't have a clue what they're talking about. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. The Bible said, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And that spirit is the Holy Ghost. And you can't be born again without the Holy Ghost. Now, you may be praying for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's fine. You may be praying for the power of the Holy Ghost. That's all good. But if you do not have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, you are not saved. If you do have him dwelling in you, that can't happen without you knowing it. There's no way. There is no way that the Holy Spirit can be living inside you and you not know it. That's the third person of the Godhead. That's the third person of the Godhead. He's God. You remember what Peter said to Ananias and Sapphira? He said, you haven't lied to man. You've lied to God. And the Holy Spirit's the one they lied to. He called him God right there in the book of Acts. Peter did. He's not an influence like some of these religious uh, uh, churches are teaching. The Holy Ghost is God. Yes. Now, God is dwelling in a house of clay. Don't you think that's quite remarkable? He's dwelling in a house of clay. But in order to dwell in a house of clay, a circumcision must take place. Just like the circumcision that took place in the plains of Gilgal. Before they could go to battle. Before the ark could go before them. Before that which is holy unto God could be separate unto God. And God could be sanctified in their sight. A circumcision takes place. And that's found in the book of Philippians chapter, or Colossians chapter number 2. Circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In putting off the body of this flesh. That's male and female. What that means is that the moment you're born of the spirit of God. You are no longer connected to the flesh that you've been living in all your life. You're still in it, this house of clay, but the Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And in order for the Holy Ghost to dwell in you like he dwells in a born-again believer, there must be a separation take place. And that, of course, is what happens at the moment you're born again. I know the day, I know the moment he came into me. Hallelujah to God. I know the moment. Well, the children of Israel took Jericho. God gave it to them, just like he said he would. A great victory was won. They shouted and glorified God and blew the ram's horn. They'd had the Passover right before they went in there and the circumcision, and they understood the holy, ground, holy, holy unto God, understood that it was the first fruits unto the Lord, like the firstborn, beginning of the strength. It was the pattern that all the rest of them should follow. These are all the things that they learned. But then they got a little uppity and a little arrogant. And Ai was a little city over there nearby. And instead of falling on their face and crying out to God like they did at Jericho, they had a little military meeting and said, not send a few down, no big deal. We'll take them. I mean, look how Jericho fell as if they caused it to fall. They hadn't learned their lesson yet. Many of you in this house tonight have had one, you've won battles, you've seen things change in your life, and you still haven't learned the lesson. God did it, not you. God does it. God is the one that goes before us and fights our battles. But anyway, they ran before the face of the men of Ai. Thousands of them died. They came back and cried to God. But the Bible said plainly, they did not seek the face of the Lord. Now, what is Ai? Do you remember when Abraham came into the land of Israel? Do you remember when he went and built his altar? Genesis chapter number 12. The first altar that Abraham built, a prayer, a place of prayer, was at Bethel. And that altar was between Bethel and Ai. Bethel means house of God. Ai means trash heap. <laughs> That's ever the way it is in the Christian life. You've got a right hand and a left hand. You're constantly making choices. One of them leads to blessedness, God's favor, and victory, and the other one leads to a trash heap and a ruined Christian life and a wasted life. 
I don't want to see the day come when you get 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, if you live that long, Lord doesn't come back, and you look at your life one day in the mirror and you say to yourself, my, what a waste I am. I was in a store the other day. It was over here at, uh, I forget, the hardware store or somewhere. You know, they play music. They're playing music all the time over the, over the, over the speakers. Well, I, I normally tune it out. <laughs> but this time, for some reason, it got my attention. And some fellow was on there singing. And here's what he was singing. I have nobody to blame but myself. <laughs> oh, he was. It was like that, too. I thought, you poor devil. <laughs> nobody to blame but myself. Then he was lamented and went into all of them bad things he'd done, mistakes he'd made. But that got my attention. I mean, when's the last time you heard a song, I have nobody to blame but myself? <laughs> But what he was doing was doing a little self, uh, uh, a little self introspection, I guess, a little self inspection, and he's saying, "I've made a waste of my life. I've blown it." Yeah, you will blow it. I'll blow it. You'll blow it. If you refuse to sanctify the Lord God in your life, set Him apart where He belongs, give Him the glory that He alone deserves. Look to him every day of your life and say, thank you, Lord, for getting me through another day. Thank you, Lord, for every victory that I have enjoyed. Thank you, Lord, for the breath that I'm breathing. Thank you, Lord, for the food that I'm eating, for the roof over my head. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that I'm here and I exist. Thank you, Lord. Set him apart. Sanctify him. Therefore, you're giving him what belongs to him. But when you take it, like Achan did, and you take what belongs to God and try to use it for yourself, it will turn into a curse. In other words, you start taking the glory. You start taking the praise. You start, uh, I remember, I hadn't been that long ago, I was watching a preacher somewhere, and he came out of the pulpit, and he came running down the steps and ran down, and he said, I want you to know something. I'm somebody. I thought to myself, if you only knew who you were. <laughs> Have you ever noticed, dear friend, that uh, words are powerful, words are important, but the spirit is more important? Have you ever heard anybody say the right thing with the wrong spirit? You see what I'm saying? A person who says the right thing with the wrong spirit, that person is taking credit for it because the Holy Ghost is not putting his seal on it. The Holy Spirit is not anointing it. This anointing from God is so very important. And he will anoint it if you sanctify him and give him the glory where he is the Lord God running your life. I am what I am by the grace of God, Paul said. I'm not somebody. I was a nobody that God saved and wrote his name, the Lamb's Book of Life. And Mephibosheth is probably one of the best illustrations in all the Bible as to a true believer. When they came to him and David said, Is there any of the house of Saul that I might show kindness for my servant, for Jonathan, his, his son's sake? And they said, Well, there's one down at Lodibar, and he's lame in his feet, and go get him. And they brought him to the house of David and set him down at the table. And Mephibosheth said, What a dog am I? I mean, who am I that a king would have me come to his table? If you could ever keep that attitude, you will sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Really, if you'll ever keep the attitude, I'm just an old dog that God's been invited to his table. Hallelujah. The door swings open wide. And God is a good God. He's a good God. He's a good God. There's so many chapters in the Bible leading up to where Christ said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. All of that history of Israel and all of the history of men Come up to the point where Christ at the cross at Calvary, his tormentors were standing before him, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the heart of God. That's the heart of God. That's the heart of God. I want the right spirit. That is so important because the right spirit will be anointed by the Holy Spirit, 
And if the Holy Spirit anoints what you're doing, you can't help but be blessed. But if he doesn't, then you're going to have to, you're going to, have to work up the flesh and do it like that and try to do it by the flesh, and it won't work. It never will work. never has worked. never will work. I don't care how loud you scream. You can, you can run the pews. You can climb the walls. You can do anything swing from the chandeliers. It's not going to change a thing. It's nothing but a parade of the flesh and a fleshly performance without the power of the Holy Ghost. We've got to sanctify him in our hearts. So when Abraham built his altar, he had a trash heap on one side and he had Bethel on the other, house of God. It's still that way today. Every day you're going to make a choice. You'll make a choice in the morning when you get up. Three o'clock this morning I was praying. Three o'clock. I prayed from three till four, a little after four. And that's not unusual, not with me at all. And I pray. I do a lot of my praying at night like that, early in the morning. Three or four o'clock in the morning, praying, talking to God. It's 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 quiet, it's peaceful, and you can get and you can and you can communicate with the Lord. I have found that prayer for me is a twenty-four hour thing. Twenty-four hours. Everywhere, all the time. Pray without ceasing. Talk to the good Lord. Sanctify him in your heart. I'm up here tonight. Folks, I could have been dead five years ago. I had an ejection fraction of nineteen. I was talking to a man the other day, and he said he had an ejection fraction of 26, nearly died. I said, well, mine's 19. <laughs> That's heart failure. Heart failure. So weak, I couldn't, couldn't. <laughs> you just don't understand how weak I was. Just, and I thought I'd never get over it, but I did in time. I did in time. God's been good to me. He's been good to me. If I don't live another week, a week, God's been good to me. He's a good God. The most important thing in life is to be sure you're ready to meet God. Whatever God does is right. I may not like it, but it's still right. Every one of us have a Jericho standing before us. Every last one of us. And we've got to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and before the people. We've got to finish well. We've got to finish well, folks. We've got to finish well. <laughs> I know some that ran, and they ran good, and they ran hard, but they're not running anymore. They're running from God. I wonder how they're going to finish. You see what I'm saying? How you finish has a great deal to do with your testimony before people. Yes, it does. How are you going to finish? Finish well. Finish well. The Apostle Paul says, the time of my departure is at hand. The Apostle Peter said, the Lord hath showed me how I must shortly leave this my tabernacle. Both of these great apostles knew their time had come. And Paul said, I finished my course. God let him know it was over. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Yes, sir. Finish well. Finish well. Finish well. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use this little lesson tonight for the glory of God. I pray you'd bless their folk. Our Heavenly Father, maybe some in here tonight who struggle with what I'm trying to talk about, what I tried to say to them. They're struggling with it. They, 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 can't, they can't get a handle on it. They're struggling with it. If they could just lay their life down here tonight and say, Lord God, you're my Lord, not me, not me. You are. I lay my life down here tonight in Jesus' sweet, holy, blessed, righteous name so that so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. In thy name we pray. Amen. Well, keep your heads bowed for a minute. Is there anybody in here tonight, since this is prayer meeting, anybody in here tonight raise your hand and say, Preacher Lawson, why don't you pray for me because I need to do what you're talking about. Sanctify the Lord in my heart and give him what he, what he deserves. It, it's his, what belongs to him. God bless you. God bless you. Got hands up everywhere. Well, good. God bless all of you. God bless every one of you. Give him what belongs to him. It's his. It's his. You try to take it, and you try to use it, it'll become a curse. That's what happened to Jericho. It'll become a curse. Joshua made a prophecy after they'd taken Jericho. He said, Cursed be the man who rebuilds this city. He'll rebuild it in his firstborn. He'll lay the foundation in his firstborn. Remember, 
firstborn, first fruits, a can. See, he'll lay it in the strength of his soul and it'll become a curse. Don't let it be that. Don't let it be that. Because when you take it and do it, you it's in your hands. I don't want it in my hand. I want God, I want my life in God's hands, not my hands. I want my life in God's hands, not mine. Father, I pray for every hand that went up tonight. Pray for them. I pray, Heavenly Father, for spiritual wisdom and vision. I pray, Lord, they'd be able to see the thing that you want to do in their life and how your hand worked in, works in their life. The fellowship that you want to have with them, Lord, the victories you want to give them, the blessings that you have for them. What a life it is to live for thee. There's no comparison on this earth. There's nothing on this earth to compare with a life lived for thee. Father, I pray for them. I pray for that one tonight struggling. They're struggling. They're struggling. They take a step forward and two backward. It just seems like nothing works out. It seems like the hardest effort they put into it is just nothing. There's no blessing. There's just constant struggle. No blessing, no good, no nothing. I pray for them. I pray, Heavenly Father, they learn a simple truth, Lord. The battle's the Lord's. They turn it over to you and give it to you and put it in your hands. It belongs to thee. What a battle you fought at Calvary. What a victory you won. In your holy name I pray, Lord. In Jesus' blessed, righteous name, amen, amen, amen.